Bobby. Get him. You are listening to Brave Talk Radio. You're just in time to join today's brave conversations with your hosts, Jackie Little Guest, Daryl Williams, and Tony Emma Hill. Jackie, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing good. I just uh, got finished working out because uh, we've been snowed in the past couple of days. Uh, I really didn't get a chance to work out the past couple of days. So I ran seven miles today and I worked out. What? And uh, yeah, I, I run. Usually when I work out, I average uh, anywhere from five to seven miles running, you know. And um, I work out with the weights and, you know, I fraternize just a little bit. But I spend most of the time either running or working out with the, uh, doing an uh, actual weight, working out with weights, let's say it that way. Yeah, well, I've been a little slack these past few weeks, probably since uh, maybe Thanksgiving I've been slack. My husband and I usually walk anywhere from four to five miles, five on a good day, about three, four days a week. But since the temperatures dropped and Christmas season came in, we haven't gotten back on, on track yet. But you sound like you well and on your way. Well, walking, since you said that, walking is actually the best form of exercise. Dick Gregory highly recommends walking. I mean, I listen to him, and I've taken a lot of my health consciousness and cues from from him. I mean, Dick Gregory is, I think, 83 years old, and he gets up every morning and walks like 10 miles every morning. Uh, I think that's amazing for someone 80-plus years of age age to be able to do that. And um, in the spring and summer months, that's when I spend a lot of time walking. I'll still do my five miles or whatever in the gym, but... Especially on the weekends, I'll go to uh, Freedom Park here in Charlotte, and um, that park is uh, point six feet. That's the distance around the park. So I'll, I'll walk around the park anywhere from ten to twenty times around the whole park. Uh, is that that track that's right there around the the little pond they have in the middle? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. yeah. I love going out there. It's beautiful in the spring at springtime and in the, during the summer months. Yeah. yeah, a lot of nice and mature trees out there. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, we've been blessing a lot of people, uh, Tony. We've been blessing a lot of people, man. I, 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 this morning I had the opportunity to go and talk to, uh, I don't know if you guys noticed when you walked in uh, service this morning, there were three dark-skinned greeters standing uh, at the doorway as, as you came through the main entrance. And I walked up to them and I talked to them and I told them how beautiful they were. I do that with everybody. You know, and I asked them had they been listening to the radio show and they told me no and they asked me what we had been talking about. And I told them. And what two of the girls told me that they wanted the information because they, uh, being very dark-skinned women, they have children that are dealing with what we've been talking about. Yeah. And I was able to give them some information. I told the uh, one parent about this uh, documentary called Dark Girls. I told her to have her, her and her daughter sit down and watch that documentary. That would help. And I reiterated some of the things we've been talking about for the, for the past couple of weeks. And then last week uh, on a Thursday night, one of our sound ministry people came to me and told me he had um, listened to the broadcast and how amazed he was at some of the information that we're, we're disseminating, some of the discussions that are taking place, and just how happy he was to hear uh, someone in Charlotte and that attends his church being brave enough <laughs> to, talk <laughs> about, to talk about these things. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was funny. I just laughed. He told me. Specifically, he said the, the more these shows are broadcast, he said that uh, this is exactly what he said. He said either somebody's going to kill you or you're going to need a police escort everywhere you go. Here's the thing, and, and, there, and, 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 and I know he said that in jest and in joking, but uh, darkness hates the light, period. Yeah, so right. any time a person start shining light on dark issues and dark places and lighten up the, the, the corners and the crevices, you know, exposure comes about. And a lot of times people don't like to be exposed in their way of thinking. You know, I'm, yeah. I was working with this committee at my daughter's school, and I'm a black and white kind of person when it comes down to what I do and how I do it. If there is a policy or procedure on how to do something, my history, my ancestral history has taught me that if you, dark one, don't do it by the policy, if something should go wrong, you will be Mm -hmm. crucified by Mm -hmm. that policy. However, if someone else of a different persuasion, of Mm -hmm. lighter skin than you, of a mm-hmm. different race than you, 
does not quite mm-hmm. follow the policy, they will receive more leniency. And so I was questioning this process and this procedure that the group was going through, and, you know, I just posed some questions, just trying to make sure my understanding was right. And this chick had the nerve to respond to the group, I'm just not used to being this, this formal. And I wanted to respond back, I know why you haven't. But with me being the only dark one on this committee of about 15 people, I just said, you know, I'm, I'm sure y'all aren't used to following policies and procedures because it's not in your DNA makeup or your history to do that. Because one of the things that, and we can talk about this even further today, when you're raising an African-American child or even native Indian child, what you do is you raise that child to walk into their heritage and mm-hmm. to um, begin to understand their privilege that was taken away from them but now given back to them. So you're rearing them differently. But when a Caucasian family raises their Caucasian child, they have to raise them to understand what it means to let go of their white privilege Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. that is what history dictates. And Mm -hmm. people don't consciously think about that when they're trying to work on teams where people are still hanging on to the white privilege that they've had, and they don't understand that a sister coming into this situation, a black woman coming into this situation, an African woman coming into this situation, an African-American woman coming into this situation, she's going to be policy and procedural driven because Mm -hmm. she knows when things go awry, she's Mm -hmm. going to be looked at through a more stringent scope than the Mm -hmm. next one. And that's important when we as business professionals and so on, when we're in these arenas and working with people, we have to understand those dynamics and the psyche of that person based on their history. Mm-hmm. You're so right. You're so right. We, you know, I've always heard we have to work a little bit harder. We do have to work harder because of the society that we live in. You know, we can't just, you know, say it's okay and, you know, just brush and, and just whatever, we do have to work harder. And some people just don't believe, no, 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 we don't have the same privileges. We have to prove ourselves a little bit more than others. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you have to be at the top of your class, the top of your game. You have to be uh, pretty much flawless when it comes to being able to compete in this professional arena. And, again, and I go back to one of the discussions we had before when we talk about customer service, it's so funny to me how we can give our own people bad customer service, but you let someone of a different persuasion come in the building, and you start stepping and fetching like like, um, Uncle Charlie out out there on the plantation. Crazy. Mm -hmm. You said that's so right. Yeah, but the standard of care should be, optimal for all people. It should be optimal. It should be at its utmost greatness for Mm -hmm. all people in how we deal with one another on a professional level, on a social level. You know, you got to give respect oftentimes in order to get respect. And even then, you can find yourself in situations giving respect to your brother or sister, and you don't get the same in return. Why? Mm -hmm. Because of your skin. And that's um, that's a, a serious issue. And people, oh, well, you know, aren't we beyond that? No, we're not. Look at this Stacey Dash and BET Awards and Oscar Awards situation. Mm-hmm. Well, there's a deeper issue, though. I, I want to go back before we go to Stacey Dash. You know I was itching at the bit to uh, get to that issue, but let's, let's deal with what you just said. You said the person said to you, that I used to being this formal. And see, the expectation. There's this expectation of incompetence when it comes to us. Uh, right. And I'll use myself as an example. I lived in Boston for 15 years. When I first moved there, most of the whites that I encountered didn't know how to deal with me. Number one, I'm articulate. Number two, I'm very professional. I was always on time. I was never late. Uh, number three, very proficient. When I was given a task to complete, I completed all my tasks and did so with supreme skill. Let's just say it that way. I didn't tell jokes. 
Uh, I, I saw that most of the African Americans in Boston that I encountered would disclose their private business and, 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 their, and information about their, their private life and their social life on a regular basis. I never did that. I kept to myself. I carried myself with dignity. I didn't tolerate uh, people discriminating against me. I knew how to address those issues in a way that was within the protocols, and that created a lot of problems because a lot of people, black and white, we've all been socially uh, engineered into thinking that all black people in America act a certain way. You know, we're, we're the buffoons, we're the clowns, we're the sambos, we're the jigaboos, uh, you know, and uh, we're not to be taken seriously, and we're incompetent. Uh, yeah, it, yeah. There's a movie. There's a movie. I want. I want to go here. There's a movie uh, that uh, Melvin Van Peebles did called Classified X. It's a must see. I told the young ladies that I was talking to that we offer some resources that will help you understand where all this stuff comes from. Classified X is the movie version of the black book that I talked about last week. Some people that are not going to read books like I do. I read, I read everything I can get my hands on and, mm -hmm. and have been doing so for the past 30 years. But if you can find the same type of information in a media form or in, in the form of a movie, that is much more beneficial to some people. They, don't, they just don't have time to, to do as much reading. Classified X deals with the images, the iconology, dating back to uh, the very first movie, uh, Birth of a Nation, up till the present time. And you see the same images over and over. And over. The, the, the clown, the buffoon, yeah. the sambo, all the pork dancing and shucking and jiving, the out-of-control black woman that they call Sapphire. That's nothing new. That dates back to the 1600s. The mammy images, all of that stuff that we've been seeing over and 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 over again for, for 400 years, this is what we have been taught. You know, this is what has been socially engineered and posited into our thinking. Jackie said it last week. The only point of reference she had about our, our ancestry and our history was Tarzan. You got this white man swinging around uh, in the jungle, going, oh, 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 can barely talk, but he can talk to the animals. And the black people that are there and have been there for thousands of years, they're, they're you know, looking like savages. Uh, you yeah. know, going, running around, going hooga mooga. No mention of the great empires, the great uh, uh, civilizations that were built by Africans, but all of this negative, ignominious stuff about our people that we've seen over. And if you, if that's, if that's all you've seen, that becomes your reality. And, and if that's all white people have seen when they, it, when they embark upon a situation where a black person is involved in that, in in the process. They don't expect anything from them. They expect from the clown. They expect from the, you know, shuck and jive. They expect from, from the, you know, be lazy or, you know, all the, all the stereotypes come into play. You know, going back to they, what they expect from, from us, I remember when I was about, I don't know, probably about 14, 15 years old, I wanted a part-time job. So I went to this place and the, the man, you know, called me in the office, sat me down to interview me. So, you know, it was just the two of us in there. So he did the interview, and he's like, wow, she really knows how to speak. And then he said, <laughs> now spell, spell cigarette. <laughs> and I sat there, and I'm, like I said, I'm only 14, 15. I'm like, cigarette. So I spelled cigarette for him. He says, wow, and she knows how to spell, too. And I felt the tears coming up in my eyes because, like I say, it was just the two of us in there, and I'm saying, who is this man talking to? But for him to degrade me like that, yeah. wow, mm -hmm. and she knows how to spell, too. And mm -hmm. I walked out of there, I was so, you know, if it was now, I would have said something. But being a young teenager, yeah. I just walked out and just let it go. So I'm saying, really, he expected me to get in there and not know how to speak and to not be able to spell. That is what he was looking for. And mm -hmm. when I surprised him, I was like, wow, she really does know how to do these things. But it's unfortunate. Unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Jack, you know, I, I still experience that, you know, even today. And like I said, with mm -hmm. this uh, group of people that I work on, and usually I'm one of those, I, I'm very observant. 
so you don't even know who I am or what I'm capable of while I'm sitting in your midst. And so if you, if you in your mind, take to your normal and regular thinking that this African-American woman sitting in this presence, you know, probably only has X amount of education. And if she, she does have any education beyond that, she did it by the, the nap of her neck and she didn't understand it anyway. They just passed her through the educational system. And I sit and I, and I listen and I observe. And I'm one of those methodical thinkers where I'm always thinking beyond the phrase that you just put out. I'm thinking all the way back to when I'm analyzing your thought process and how you came to and derived at the statement you just made. So anytime a person or even in a group setting people are having a discussion, I'm beyond what just came out of their mouth. I'm looking mm -hmm. at the origin of the thought and how they came about to formulate that thought in their mind to derive at whatever that statement was that came out. And it always amazes them that when I do finally speak, I don't speak to the issue that they brought up, but I speak to the deeper meaning of what they just said. Mm -hmm. And that's what constantly baffles folks. Well, you know, well, how did you, well, yeah, that is right. That is, you know, okay, well, let's talk about the real issues here. I'm not one to skirt around with time and waste time covering you know, little things and, and the little talk. Let's get to the core of the issues because my time is limited. I know that Satan knows that he has a limited time before he's cast into the lake of hell, and I know that he wants to take me with him, okay? And I got a lot of ground that God wants me to cover before then, so I ain't got time to be playing with you, moving around with these little small issues before we get to the real point. And if you want to... Uh, misjudge and miscalculate your expectation of me, then that's fine. You do that. But you know when I'm coming, I'm coming high and I'm coming hard. And you better be ready for it. And that's that not an sad. indictment on me. That's not an indictment on me. That's an indictment on you for not expecting more. Yeah. And it's sad when it's coming from our own, our very own. Mm -hmm. You know, you mm -hmm. expect it from the others. But when it's our very own people doing it to us, it, you know, really, you know, yeah, I think when it comes to other African-American people, the biggest challenge that I see is that issue of competition. Yes. I see that issue of uh, entitlement. I see the issue of, well, you don't have it that bad. And the issues of jealousy, envy, all of those things. Mm -hmm. You know, I think Daryl said it the other day, you know, this whole crab in the bucket syndrome that we talk about, but we don't talk about who put that bucket there. When I look at the systems that are at play in our relationships as a people, the system that's been put in place is to keep us divided and to keep us apart. You know, similarly, even when you look at the body of Christ and you have people going at it at each other, fighting over titles, fighting over positions, fighting over the, the right to have authority over one another, fighting to become conquerors over one another. That's not, that is not in our natural state what we were created to achieve during our time here on this earth. But... Everything that we've been talking about are systems that have been put in place by man to control the mind, to get you to do exactly what man wants you to do. And at the end of it all, at the root of it all, is economic gain. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that so started... are we going to wake up? Where are we going to wake up? And stop well, well, on well, this thing. Well, you got to remember what that now. See, this, I call it Willie Lynch syndrome. I also call this it Stockholm syndrome. Mm -hmm. And also uh, what I also call plantation mentality. I, yeah. I quoted John Henry Clark last week. He said, history is never old. It's always with us. It just continues to repeat itself in another form. So when, when I encounter, um, we're talking about African Americans and just the vitriolic nature of relationship between African Americans sometimes. But if, if you've gone through a five, six hundred year process where you've been made uh, let's, let's use the term, socially engineered into behaving a certain way, I almost, me personally, I kind of expect it. It doesn't take me by surprise as much. It just offers me, as a person who is awakened, 
the opportunity to try to enlighten people and make them conscious of where these behaviors come from so that, I mean, we can talk about uh, the fact that, 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 we're, that we're polarized, but we need to talk about what has polarized us so we can start to work to remove or, or create a different process which allows us to become more loving and sensitive to each other. That's what we need. That's, it's the plantation mentality. That's what it is. It's the plantation. The, you know, house Negro, field Negro, all of that stuff was a part yeah. of, uh, of how we were socialized, and that has never changed. And this thing with uh, uh, Jada Pinkett Smith and the Oscars and the backlash that she got from a lot of African Americans, here's the problem I have with what Jada Pinkett Smith just, just, just said. She talked about the Oscars. She talked about how African Americans are never acknowledged for their performances. They're allowed to come and be presenters and entertainers, but they're never uh, acknowledged or rewarded uh, with, uh, with the Oscar reward for their masterful performances. Okay, again, let's go back. Classify an X. You go back and you look at the motion picture industry's history and you see the images. And there have been African Americans who won won uh, the Oscar award, but they played the subservient plantation, yeah. a witch, maid, thug, criminal type roles. Those are the ones. Those are the only people that have been rewarded in Hollywood. Uh, African Americans that have been rewarded in Hollywood for their performances in movies. The same roles over and over and over again. Again, so what she said. We need to stop begging. We need to stop supporting this. I kind of agree with that. I agree. But yeah, we, we, we do. She talked, uh, and then Stacey Dash came out and said that, um, well, which I don't agree with anything she said, but she talked about BET. She talked about the BET Awards. We need to stop. I don't watch any of that stuff anyway. <laughs> because the same people that control the Oscars and all of that yeah. have a hand in their food. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I do agree with Jada. We need our own media, and we do have them. There is a, a movie channel that's online called the Urban Movie Channel. Bob Johnson, the same person who used to own BET, he owns it. And if you go, it's online. I told uh, some of my worship team singers about it a few weeks ago. If you go on there, there are a lot of films, a lot of plays, a lot of documentaries uh, that deal with our history, that deal with our culture, and it's, it's, it's very now they do have some of the thug stuff and some of the the, the regular Hollywood stuff that you you don't find in, uh, in the mainstream media, but mostly there are movies, plays, documentaries that pr that are produced by African Americans and the performances are brilliant. And some of the plays and some of the movies have Christian or religious themes, so you don't have all this cursing. You don't have all these women running around with no clothes on. Uh, the roles that uh, the actors and actors uh, perform are positive roles, upwardly mobile roles. And I think that's important for our community. I, think, I certainly think that's important for our children to see. Uh, you're not going to find that in mainstream media. You're going to find what they call reality TV, which is uh, there's nothing real about it. They script everything on those re reality shows. They tell those women to act the fool. They tell those guys that are gay to, you know, to go overboard with, with the flamboyance and wearing pumps and wearing makeup. And they, they, they're told to do that. There's not, there was a guy that I knew who was a musician. Uh, he went on uh, one of the talk shows, Jenny Jones. And he went on the talk show. And when he and his girlfriend got out there, they basically were acting. They told her to act like she was upset with him because he left her and to put on this, 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 this ostentatious performance. It was a performance. Um, nothing yeah. that, that I saw the episode. Nothing that was said on that show was true. But this is what you're, you're told to behave that way. And again, these are programs. And the, this is how the mind is programmed. This is how social engineering is carried out in a subtle form. How subliminal like messages are positive into your, into your mind and control how you think and behave. Exactly. And at the end of the day, it's about economic gain. Exactly. It's about economic gain. I mean, at the heart of it all, if, if you will act a fool and do what we tell you to do, we'll give you a few dollars in your pocket. Or you can be on this broadcast and, and, and it's going to draw attention to your name and who you are. Who knows? Maybe you'll write a book. Maybe you'll sell a book about it. What, whatever the um, case. No. At the end of the day, it's about and tell you no longer need it. Game. That's right. And then they tell you are no longer needed. And that's what, when you're no longer needed, 
When you're no longer needed, that's when you get that Negro wake up call. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> and we see how that can happen, okay? Listen, we're going to go to a break. We'll be right back. You are listening to Brave Talk Radio at TonyEmmahale.com. This is Daryl Williams of Brave Talk Radio. Back at you with another Black History Moment. Today we honor Yah Asantawa, warrior queen mother of the Ashanti Nation. Yah Asantawa was born in 1840. She was famous for leading the Ashanti Rebellion against British colonialism. She was the sister of the ruler of Ejisu, an ethnic group in present-day Ghana. Africa has been blessed with numerous women of great courage. These include Queen Adaya of Benin, Queen Amina of Zaria, and a host of other brave women leaders. Nana Asantawa was the most prominent of the lot. Her accomplishments may not have been as great as Queen Amina of Zaria in terms of span of leadership, but her standing up to fight the British occupation in West Africa in spite of an initially cowardly front put up by Ghanaian men puts her at the top of Africa's great female leaders. Asantawa was appointed queen mother by her brother, her brother Nana Akwase. His reign was marked with ups and downs. Akwase died after the Ashante Civil War from 1883 through 1888. After his death, Ya Asantawa, being very influential as queen mother, used her influence to nominate her grandson as ruler of Ajisu. In 1896, her grandson, as well as the king of Ashante, Prempe I, were exiled to the Sekulis by the British. This was the British's way of dealing with African kings in the past, as was the case with the Benin Kingdom with the capture of and exile of Oba, king of Benin, in 1897. Sending a king to exile in such times was followed by the looting of their land. This has led to the discoveries of lots of Africa's valued arts and crafts in Britain. To date, Africa has been unable to regain its stolen treasures. As expected to further heighten matters, the British Governor General of Ghana, then known as the Gold Coast, Frederick Hodgson, demanded the golden stool of the Ashanti. The golden stool was a symbol of the Ashanti nation. This prompted a conference of elders. Yah Asanta was highly disgusted at the behavior of the male counterparts and insisted that if the men would not fight, she would gather the women together to fight for the land. The British royalty was not as old or as numerous as African royalty, and even though more powerful at the time, was still of inferior quality. Yah Asantawa led the famous uprising in 1900 against the British. She was ultimately captured and sent to exile to the Sekulis. Yah Asantawa died in exile on the 17th of October in 1971. Yah Asantawa's war was the last major war led by an African woman. She is honored in Africa till this very day. Her body was later returned to Ghana where she was given a befitting burial. She is honored with a school named after her, the Yah Asantawa's Girl Secondary School. Queen Mother Yah Asantawa, Warrior Queen Mother of the Ashanti Nation. Daryl Williams, Brave Talk Radio. Hi, this is Tony Emmahel. You know, in the book of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul exhorted Ephesian believers to see prayer as a weapon to use in fighting spiritual battles. Are you fighting any spiritual battles today? Satan wants you to feel that you're all alone and that nobody cares about you or your situation. But he could be no further away from the truth. We are here for you. Join us for prayer during a weekly prayer call each Sunday at 8.30 p.m. This prayer call has two specific objectives. Our first objective is to bind the hand of the enemy that comes to kill, steal, and destroy you. Our second objective is to pray for God's covering and His protection over you as you go about the duties of your week. So join us each week, each Sunday at 8.30 p.m. by dialing 518-530-1840. That number again is 518-530-1840. You will be asked to enter an access ID, and the access ID is 211 341 
1-800-648-6648. It's Brave Talk Radio on TonyInTheHell.com with your host, Daryl Williams, Jackie Little Guest, and Tony Emmahill. All right, so we've been talking about this issue of colorism. We've been talking about uh, the adverse effects that it has on us as a people, African-American people. We've talked about the interracial tensions, and we've talked about the external racial tensions. At the end of the day, we all need to learn how this socialization process and this system that we've been brought up in over time and over years has worked into our mental psyche in such a way that we do things that we're really unconscious of the reasons why we do them. Uh, we've been talking about, so how do, how do we move beyond this? You know, when do we wake up? And I think that waking up and realizing what the issues are is paramount. You know, when we came up with this Brave Talk program, it was not a program just to discuss issues, just to be discussing. We don't do anything here. We don't talk about topics here just to be talking because we don't have that kind of time. But we're trying to enlighten you. And after we enlighten you, we want to educate and equip you to the point that you are in a position to now make some decisions and make some changes to listen to these broadcasts and not be pricked toward change is fruitless. We would much rather you not listen if this is just going to be information for you. That's why we provide you with resources. Amen. Amen. There may be somebody that's um, been listening to these broadcasts and has have derived a, a lot of hopefully useful information, but we need to bring it back home. The Bible says, as a man thinketh, so is he. And I always encourage people to try to learn as much as they can about our history and our heritage because that's, that's something that we've been completely devoid of in this society. And that's not been a point of focus of the media, mainstream media, and even our church. Um, there's some wonderful resources. We have some brilliant scholars and writers that have, uh, have really done the, the necessary groundwork and provided just a plethora of information about who we are and what we've done over the centuries. Uh, one such person is J.A. Rogers. Any of his books, I mentioned, you know, the, the book that I mentioned last week, I think it was 100 Facts About the Negro with Complete Proof. Another one of his books is The 100 Great Men of Color. Um, another one of his books is From Superman to Man. I mean, wonderful historic information that could be utilized to help get a better understanding of who we are, what we have done. We didn't start in this world as slaves. We were empire builders. We very brilliant, very super intelligent, and we're talking thousands of years of documented history. Another very good book I would recommend for someone who's having issues with self-hate and self-contempt would be uh, the, the wonderful book that was authored by Dr. Frances Cresswell, and she just passed um, a couple of weeks ago, called The ISIS Papers. Very, very, that book changed my life. When I read that book in 1992, it just made perfect sense. Um, She talked about the socialization process. She also talks about the inferiorization process that you're oblivious to as an African American if you don't have a thorough understanding and knowledge of your history. Uh, Dr. John Henry Clark has uh, written some brilliant uh, material on on our history and our heritage. You've got to start there. And just remember what the Bible says. The Bible says that you're more than a conqueror. It says you're more than, more than. You can conquer, but you're even more than that, (laughs) see. And it also says that I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Just remember that. You don't have to hate yourself. You don't have to wake up every day uh, full of uh, contempt to the point where at some point you're thinking about uh, undergoing uh, some type of uh, harmful surgery to have your nose chopped off or to have your lips chopped off or mutilate your body the way Michael Jackson did, or Little Kim has done, or Sammy Sosa has done, just to try to look uh, more European because you have a European standard of beauty because the world, through the media mechanisms, have told you that this is what beauty is. We are some beautiful people. 
We are the most beautiful people on the planet, if the truth be told. And that's what history tells you. But if you never, again, if you never do the research, you'll never know that. But just remember that. I can do all things through Christ that, that, that strengthens me. The Bible says you the head and not the tail. And you've got to believe that. You have to have a high level of self-esteem to say that uh, I'm the head and not the tail. You can't hate yourself and hate your people, which is mental illness, and believe that you can do anything. You know, That's you're your own top and not the bottom. Um, and I'm speaking specifically to my African-American sisters. When I'm at the gym, I was telling these young ladies this, this morning, I see a lot of dark-skinned women at the gym, and all of them are mean mugging. So lately I've been going up to all of them, getting right now, hey, how you doing? Why do you look like that? Why you? And the story is always the same. You know, no one has made me feel like I'm worth anything. I had a young lady start crying last week, and I saw a, a video that was done in New York of this young, beautiful, beautiful African. I would die for this woman. <laughs> she started crying, and the brothers asked her, why are you crying? This was last week. <laughs> this is on YouTube. Last week. She started crying, and she said, this society has made me hate myself. My family members, they make me feel like I'm nothing because of my skin color. You know how angry I got when I saw that. So don't tell me that what we've been talking about is a waste of time. There are a lot of people, and it's not just dark-skinned people. It's black people in general in this, in, in this society and around the world that we hate ourselves. We hate the fact that we don't believe that we're worth anything and can do anything. But I'm here to tell you. I'm here to tell you, that's a lie. <laughs> the it's devil a, a is lie. a liar. Right. The lie devil is him. a liar. If you are out there listening to us and we're talking about this on this broadcast, the devil is a liar. You're yeah. a beautiful person. The Bible says you're beautifully and wonderfully made. You're a royal priesthood. And so you got to believe. That you, the old folks say you got to know that you know that you know that you know. And I, to quote Jesse Jackson, which he ain't one of my favorites, but he said, I am <laughs> somebody. you got to believe yeah. that, and you got to walk yeah. in that. L -l Listen, and you can't be afraid to tell people <clears throat> that you are somebody. You know, I think about when Satan took Jesus in the wilderness to tempt him, and he tempted him on all counts, and everything that he tried to tempt Jesus on, Jesus came back with his identity. He said, no, 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 because it is written that, boom, 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 everything that Jesus used to come back on what the devil was trying to do to gain control of his mind so that he could control his actions and control his thinking, was he went back to the Word of God. You will find your identity in the Word of God. It starts in the book of Genesis, and it goes all the way through. You've got to believe this thing. If you say you believe in God, if you say you believe God, you trust God, then do it. And if you have doubt, then you go to God, and God will help you because God is he's there waiting for you okay, God, I, I'm having this low self-esteem. You can talk to God like you talk to anybody else. You don't have to go to him with this melodious, oh, no, God is just waiting for you. Come just talk to me. All I want you to do is just talk to me and tell me what you already know. But you still, just go to him and talk to him. Tell him, you know, God, this is how I'm feeling. And, you know, it's a process. It doesn't yeah. mean it's going to happen overnight. It's a process. Yeah. Have a conversation with him. Daryl, Dar Dar get, get your point out. Um, it, it, and I keep going back to history, and some people say, and then Jackie raised this question brilliantly a couple of weeks ago. I think it was a couple of weeks ago or last week. What difference does that make today? It makes all the difference in the world, and there's a biblical precedent for it. The Bible yeah. tells us, here. this is where I'm dangerous, because I've, I've read the Bible like five, six times, and there's certain things that uh, will trigger certain things in me that will cause me to remember certain uh, salient points mm -hmm. uh, of Scripture that speak to what it is that we're dealing with today. Uh, the Bible tells us that just before the children of Israel crossed over the Jordan River, yeah. you can read, I think it's in the book of Joshua, it says that Joshua gathered all the Israelites together and read to them from the book. And what he read to them from the book was their history, all that they had gone through when they came out of Egypt, how they wandered through the world, all that God had done for them and brought them through and brought them up to the point where they were, where they were about to cross over. Just so don't tell me 
that history don't matter. And I do know, I'll give you an even better precedent for it, our, our brothers and sisters uh, that are Jewish. I had a good friend up in Boston, his name was Herb Blick, and this is when uh, the light bulb went off in, 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 in my brain computer, one of them anyway, I've got, I got several, because i got a big head, but anyway, um, me and Herb would talk often about uh, what he and his a congregation of Jews would discuss whenever they went to the synagogue. And you know what they discussed often in the synagogue? One thing the Jewish community is consistent about, even in, they're the ones that control all of these movies, by the way, that we see. In the movies, in the television propaganda, there's always something in there about what they have gone through. All of this stuff about forget about your history and forget about, no, Jewish people, they control the finances of the whole world. The World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, they run that. <laughs> well, they control the media. They own all the malls. <laughs> they own some nations, okay? Yeah. But history is a very, very much a paramount part of what they, what they talk about and what they discuss. And they, their model is never forget. So anytime I hear black folks come, oh, well, that, well, that was yesterday. I, ain't got, I got a house. No, it's, it's important and significant now to us as it is to any other people. And the Bible it's, says so. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a powerful thing to chart your path so that you won't have those historical points repeated in your life because you'll understand the dark place that some things come from and you'll learn how not to fall prey to it. See, when we talk about getting wisdom and we talk about getting understanding, see, you get that understanding and now you can rightly apply that knowledge based on your understanding in such a way that you don't have to travel down that road again. So we're going to close out this broadcast and this topic of discussion the same way we started it. And we started it with the word of God that says, love thy neighbor as you love thyself. Love yourself. And be encouraged. Be encouraged. Yeah. Yeah. Brave talk radio. <laughs> you are listening to Brave Y'all Talk Radio friends. at TonyMHale.com. Today's broadcast has been brought to you by Next Level Plus Project Management and Business Consultants. Learn more about how Next Level Plus can help you solve the right problems and seize the right opportunities by calling 704 780 2997 or visit their website at nextlevelplus.org.